So what we need to do now is look at in large part EPT, so Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera, and Coronamids. We need some metrics to judge who gets the gold medal here. And what we chose are 10 sort of standard measurements uh, that everybody tends to look at. One is total abundance. So how many specimens did you get there? All right. Richness, the number of species or genera that is in a sample, a diversity index that will come through, and then some composition measures. And we'll, we'll hit the highlights of all of these. Percent coronamids in your samples. The percent of these three groups in a sample. Okay. The total number of taxa. Okay. And the composition of the dominant taxa. So is there one genus, family, what have you, that predominates in your sample? All right. The other thing that almost everybody always does is the Hilsenhoff Family Biotic Index or the Hilsenhoff Biotic Index. These factor in, if you remember, I was talking about the apodanids. I said they have a tolerance value of three. That brings this in. And finally, we'll go through trophic habitats. And the one thing I want to focus on, because I wasn't sure a few people were interested in it, is the percent shredders. Okay, so that's looking at feeding niches of all these organisms, and it is out there in the literature. Okay, so 10 metrics, and away we go. So the first thing we have to look at is total abundance. All right, that's the total count of individuals in a sample. Now, here's the thing. You think a higher number is more productive run in your river, right? But what if a disturbance, like say agricultural runoff, uh, can dramatically increase a population of invertebrates that thrive in a nutrified environment, okay? So that's, that's the confounding thing with that measurement, is your total abundance, you know, if there's an algal bloom there or something and you have a bunch of algal grazers, yeah, you're gonna have spectacular numbers, but is that a sign of quality? The other thing that is typically looked at here is also the number of unique taxa per site. And the traditional thinking is more taxa means less disturbed site. All right. So you don't have maybe an algal bloom that chokes out everything else except the only thing that can eat the algae and survive in a, a low oxygen environment, okay? So two things we're gonna start with. Okay, oops, here we go. So total number of organisms. And you know, saying McLeod Creek wasn't that great. Look at that, it hardly has any organisms relative to Whitehorse. Solomon Creek, Greg River are about the same, but Whitehorse Creek buries everything. Let's face it, that, that's huge difference in numbers. And again, it's a standardized sample by Cavan. Three minutes, zigzag pattern, hitting all the habitats. So you've done that perfect. That is a real difference, okay? So, Keep in mind the problem I said, though, about what happens if there's a pollutant in there that allows one thing to thrive. The analogy would be, um, for those of you that are birders, what if there's a whole bunch of the equivalent of house sparrows here? Doesn't necessarily mean it's a good site. Solomon Creek, so the number of unique taxa. Interesting. Your Greg River is your gold medalist. McLeod River, second. Solomon Creek, not that far behind either. And then finally, Whitehorse Creek bringing up the rear. So it wins gold medal here, 
it's off the podium here. Okay. And if you have any questions about these folks, feel free to turn on your mic and interrupt. Now, the next thing, there are two indices, abundance and richness measure indices that are typically used. Shannon Wiener is generally preferred. Um, and there's this horrible long formula. But it accounts for both richness and evenness. So the idea being the total number of taxa and how evenly are they in equal proportions. It factors both of those into coming up with a metric. So as the numbers and the distribution of taxa increases in a community, so does the value of H. Okay. The problem becomes when you're dealing with this is your number of taxa. And this also comes true for the previous one, total number of taxa, the handling of a mixture of family level and genus level identifications. So what happens is say, if you have a whole bunch of apotanid mayflies or uh, caddisflies, and you identify a bunch to the family level, apotanidae, because they're so small, you can't do anything more. And the rest you identify is apotania. So you've identified them as genus. Sort of logic dictates for that formula. If all, most all the rest of your groups um, are identified to the genus level, you should probably punt out the ones that are only at the family level, not use those numbers uh, for total numbers, nor for actual um, taxa, all right? So you delete the things. If you've done almost everything to genus, delete the specimens that are only done to family because you may be repeating yourself for number of taxa, all right? So looking at this, remember, the higher is better. Oh, look, Solomon Creek is number one, close second to McLeod River, uh, pretty close as well. This is almost like speed skating. Um, Greg River is a very close third. And bringing up the rear is Whitehorse Creek. Okay, so if this works, no, it won't work without my pointer. But keep that in mind, McLeod River is suddenly doing well again, even though we know it had the fewest specimens collected. So compositional measures we need to deal with. And these are very good, useful metrics. Percent coronamids, the higher number, typically coronamids are thought to be very tolerant of organic pollutants. So whether it's increased silting, any sort of nutrification, lower oxygen content, coronamids can handle it. So generally thought a higher number indicates poor water quality. And remember that I said about what happens if you have a whole bunch of the equivalent of starlings, it can skew your total number, right? Percent dominant taxa is useful. So the higher the number reflects a more impacted environment because it's indicated something very specific is thriving in that to the exclusion maybe of a more spread out fauna, all right? So those are two very useful metrics. Percent coronamids, Ew. Suddenly Solomon Creek is an absolute dog. It's far and away the worst were percent coronamids. Whitehorse Creek is a way down there, okay? And this is one you don't want to win. Um, the Greg River, third, and McLeod River, yeah, it didn't have much fauna. There's a number of specimens, but of those specimens collected, there were very few coronamids. Hmm, okay? So doing that for a goodness for this metric, You'd say McLeod River's first, Greg River's second, Whitehorse is third, and Solomon Creek hasn't even started the race yet. Dominant taxa. And this is one, hopefully at this point, 
some of you are getting an inclination of what the final metrics are going to look like. So again, this is sort of a useful one for thinking about, is there something that is blooming in essence, phonistically in an area? Whitehorse Creek is shocking uh, in terms of over 45% of it, of what you collected is one taxa, one genus. Greg River is well down there. Solomon Creek is down there. McLeod River is again bringing out the rear. So what that's saying is your taxa is distributed relatively evenly. Okay. Now, 